council meeting. And uh, we are allowed to meet virtually by order of the governor. And so I'm going to quickly test audio with people uh, on the screen. And uh, we may have other people join us uh, as well. So um, in terms of counselors being present, uh, Kathy Shane. Present. Mindy Johanneke. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Alyssa Brewer. Alyssa Brewer. Just unmute and say present. Present. Sarah Schwartz. Present. Uh, Evan Ross. Present. And Lynn Griesmer is present. We hey, Lynn. may be joined by others, but let me go ahead. Yes. I noticed that Andy is in as listed as an attendee. Oh, let's make sure from over in the end. And Bob, Bob Hagner is actually on the a non is a resident non voting member of the finance committee, so he could be invited in as well. And Darcy is present. Ah, Darcy, that. thank you. Okay. Andy's and present. Just, thank you, Andy. And Bob Hagner, please unmute and identify yourself as present. Yes, I'm, I'm present. Okay. And then I just want to make sure that others, Guilford, can you hear us? Yes. And Amy is also there, right? Thank you. Yes. Uh, Megan, can you hear yes. us? Yes, I can hear you. Justin? Justine? Justine, yes, I can hear you. Okay, Sonia. Are you present and able to unmute? <laughs> yes, I'm here. Okay, Paul. Yes, present. Okay, and Sean, you're running this for us. Are you you're present? And Athena, can you hear us? I'm here, yep. Okay, then we should proceed and I'll turn it over to Paul. Thank you. Um, so thank you, uh, Megan and Justine for being here. This is an information session. There are no decisions will be made uh, by the town council uh, to talk about uh, block rates. And I think I'll, look, I'll be looking to Guilford for a little more context for this, but just for your benefit, um, Sonia is our finance direct, interim finance director. Um, Sean is our IT director. Athena is our clerk to the council. Everyone else is a member of the town council, which also serves as our board of water and sewer commissioners. Uh, Bob Hegner uh, isn't on the council, but is a member of our finance committee. So that's your audience as you make your presentation. Uh, you know Guilford and Amy, obviously, because you've worked a whole lot with them. And I think the idea on this is, I know you have a presentation um, to talk about introduce the concept of block rates, which the town has not done before. Uh, it's something, and explain why we should be considering this, why uh, the, the town might be in um, considering this. And then I think just other general questions that members of the, the council may have uh, for Guilford or whoever on, on the water and sewer issues that we're talking about today. Uh, Guilford, is there anything that you or Amy want to add to that? Uh, no, I think that's it. Okay, so uh, we, we, I think the I think Sean or, or Athena are running the slideshow, the slide deck, so they'll be able to. So I'll leave it. I'm not sure who's going to head it off by Megan or Justine, but uh, Justine, well, I'm going to I'm going to get us started. Um, Okay, are you, are you set, Athena, to have us go? Yep, go ahead. 
Okay, so um, primarily the, the presentation we started with focuses on um, water rate structures. We had done some work looking at water rates for the town in the past. Um, most of the concept that we're talking about would, would also apply to the sewer rates. Um, the, the decision on how to set the rates goes a little bit differently on the water and sewer, but um, we can answer any questions related to that at the end. So if you wanna go to the next slide, we can get started. So we just wanted to kind of give a little bit of an overview our, on how water rates are determined um, before you get into the, the block versus a uh, fixed structure. So the user fees, basically customer bills that they pay would generate the funds necessary for the, the daily operation and maintenance of the water system, um, as well as a long-term investment into your system. So your, your prices need to reflect the cost required to operate and maintain the quality of the, of the water and, and your infrastructure so that you can provide funds for repairs, rehabilitation, and replacements. So the next slide. So there are different methods to establishing weights. The American Water Works Association has a, has a manual that op um, outlines the methodology. So there are a lot of technical uh, analysis that has to go into place to basically look at your revenue requirements, which would be your operating and capital cost and the cost of service. Um, so different costs to serve different classes of people you need to consider, versus residential versus commercial. Um, and then you would go into your rate design so that you would, could set the rates to meet the revenue and cost of service and also factor in any debt services that you have um, that you need to pay off based on your rates. Next slide. So the key aspects when you're looking at setting rates um, is, is communication first and foremost, because you have to communicate between the customers and the utilities and the policymakers to make sure everybody is on board. Um, you know, this presentation is kind of that, that first step to kind of give the information. Um, financial planning, so you need to have a, a thorough plan will better help officials make informed decisions um, when revenue decreases occur. And data management, which is basically the, the engineering side of, of this whole thing, is it's you need to go through a lot of detailed data on customer water use, operating expenses, inf infrastructure maintenance, um, so that you can better manage system fluctuations over time. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of data that goes into looking at what your rates should be to basically be sustainable. Um, a lot of formulas, you look at the debt services, you look at upcoming capital plans that you need to fund, um, and, and all of that goes into a decision process. The next slide. So the pricing structure, so your, your rates put a value onto the water supplied. If your rates are too low, then it can cause too much water use by, by consumers, and the rates need to obviously cover all of your costs. Um, to be sustainable. The specific price structures can be in place to encourage water conservation. So that's mainly the big push for doing a block structure. Lower usage results in lower rates. Um, so you're kind of rewarding water conservation by paying a lower water rate. The next slide. So there are pretty much three types of rate structures. Um, there are two different types of block rates, which basically means that depending on the amount of water that you use, you're charged a different rate. Um, an ascending block rate has, once you divide the user usage into blocks, each su like succeeding block, so the more water that you're using, you charge at a higher rate than the previous block. So this is basically an attempt to charge a higher rate for non-essential water use and it basically, um, the customers are charged a lower rate for less water usage. So this promotes water conservation. Um, a uniform rate, which is currently what, what Amherst uses, um, is one constant unit price for all metered water usage. And then there is also something that's called a descending block rate, which divides water that each block would be charged a lower rate than the previous rate. So this would be kind of that mentality of buying it in bulk. Um, the more water that you use, the less money you'd have to pay for it. Um, this obviously doesn't promote water conservation and is actually illegal under the mass general law. So 
towns um, and communities in Massachusetts can't use a descending block rate. So I'm gonna hand it over to, to Megan now, who's gonna kind of explain a little bit about the current rate structure and then kind of give some examples of what some of the surrounding communities are using. Hey, Megan, this is Paul. I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. I apologize. Yeah. Uh, could you each sort of introduce yourselves and oh. what, your, what your role is or your background is, stuff like that, so the council gets a better sense of uh, who you guys are? Yeah. Yeah, um, I can go first because I obviously was the one who was just talking to you. So, so my name is Justine Carroll. Um, I've been, my, my background is in civil and environmental engineering. I've been at Tate and Howard for 13, going on 14 years now. Um, I've been there pretty much since I, I started right out of college. I'm the, uh, a vice president. Uh, I, I am pre predominantly on the water side. Um, we do both water and sewer at Tate and Howard, but, but my team, team does, does mostly water. Um, anything else you want to know about me or <laughs> that kind of <laughs> cover okay <laughs> so uh, I'll hand it over to Megan now <laughs> um, Megan I'm a project engineer with Tata and Howard uh, I've been there a little over four years I have about eight years of experience um, in general um, in water and wastewater I'm also on the wastewater side of things at Tata and Howard um, and that's, that's it good. That's <laughs> okay thank you <laughs> Um, okay, next slide, please. So I'll talk about Amherst's current rate structure. Um, they have a uniform rate of $3.80 per 100 cubic feet, which is a standard unit of measure for water rates and sewer rates, um, with a minimum quarterly charge of $10.20, which corresponds to a minimum volume of usage. Um, that's about, um, based on the 1020 and the $3.80 per 100 cubic meat, uh, feet. Um, that's a little over 2,000 gallons, which in a quarter, um, most occupied buildings will reach that minimum, um, minimum volume. So basically you're paying for the actual metered usage beyond that point. Um, Amherst recently established agricultural rates in 2018 and there are strict guidelines that define what land is applicable. Um, it would be a uh, participant in the MGL Chapter 61A or the Agricultural Preservation Program with an agricultural preservation restriction placed on the property. And the same uniform rate applies, the $3.80 um, per 100 cubic feet. Um, you just not charge sewer. Um, the uniform rates are simple to implement and understand for all the customers. Um, and they do provide um, revenue stability um, over more complex rate structures. Next slide. So the ascending block rate um, overview and benefits, um, as Justine said, it divides the volume of usage into ascending rates. Um, as you use more water, you start to pay a higher rate for that usage. Um, and when designed properly, the idea is that you pay a higher price for non-essential water use. Um, MassDEP promotes this price, promotes this price structure um, as it promotes and rewards water conservation as you pay less for using less water. Next slide. So you can also have different user categories. Amherst has one, no user categories, everybody pays the same, um, but you could have residential, industrial, commercial. Um, some examples of nearby towns that have different user categories. Um, you'll see in later slides that Agawam has um, ascending block rate structure for residential users. Um, but for non-residential users, which would include commercial and industrial, they have a uniform rate of $2.38 per 100 cubic feet, um, which is the highest rate for all residential users. Um, Hadley has an ascending block rate structure for commercial users, um, as you can see in this table here. Um, and they're all higher. Agawam has generally lower rates, but they also have, we'll talk later, um, a quarterly service charge, which helps make up for that. Um, but Hadley has generally higher rates for commercial than Amherst charges, $3.80. Um, next slide. So 
So separate irrigation meters, um, as we talked about before, Amherst already has this for agricultural users. Um, and this means that you have a second meter to reflect water that's not returned to the sewer system, and you don't pay the sewer rates on that irrigation meter water. Um, you are, Amherst requires a backflow preventer um, that's routinely tested and inspected um, to prevent contamination into the rest of the water main um, for safety reasons. Next slide. So the fixed charges is another aspect of the water bill. Um, it's the minimum fee, uh, minimum bill that a customer will receive regardless of water usage. Um, there are different types. Um, the billing customer would recover costs for either meeting re meter readings or billing costs. Um, service meter charges, they would increase uh, with your meter size, if you had a three quarter inch meter versus one inch meter or greater, um, your cost, your fixed charge would increase with that meter size. Then the minimum charge, which is what Amherst has, typically relates to a minimum volume of consumption. And these fixed charges, um, the more so the first two types, the billing and customer and the service meter charge, um, help to increase revenue stability. Next slide. So we looked at what um, the surrounding communities have for water rates. Um, so these, the towns in these, in this table are uniform rates without different user categories. So these are all one flat rate. Um, you'll notice um, South Deerfield Water Supply District is a little different than the others. Um, they have the $1 and uh, $1.375 per thousand gallons um, for water usage, which comes out to be once you convert it to the 100 cubic feet, uh, about a dollar and three cents per 100 cubic feet. But in addition to the water usage, they have a water tax rate of a dollar and eight cents per $1,000 of property value. So it's a little different um, to compare directly. You can't say um, South Deerfield will generally have lower uh, water bills because that's not the case once you factor in the water tax rate. Um, but it's worth noting that Amherst does have um, the lowest rate of, of these uniform rate billing structure of the surrounding communities. Um, next slide. So these are the rate structures of surrounding communities with block rate structures. Um, you can see the tiers for the usage will vary um, and then the rates vary as well. Um, Northampton the numbers in this table are for a one inch or smaller meter. They have a uniform rate for any meters that are above one inch. And that uniform rate is $5.99, $5.99 per 100 cubic feet, which is slightly less than the highest tier of um, smaller meters. Um, and with the exception of Agawam, um, the rates are generally higher. Um, in the surrounding communities, especially once you factor in the um, service charges. Hadley has a minimum, has a service charge based on the meter size and Agwam has a $35 across the board service charge for all semi-annual billing. Next slide, please. So these are the, some of the fixed charges. Um, for the surrounding communities. Hadley, these are based, Hadley and Northampton are one inch service charge, um, 32.50 quarterly, uh, 38.23 quarterly for Northampton, um, 35 semi-annually for Agawam and $10 for Belchertown. Um, Agawam and Belchertown is charged that fee regardless of the meter size, um, which help to help make up for the lower um, water rates for Agawam. Next slide, please. So these are some suggestions for Amherst. Um, the current uniform rate does not 
um, encourage water conservation as much as a ascending block rate structure would. And the minimum charge based on um, a minimum volume doesn't, it allows more fluctuation in revenue than a fixed fee based on service charge or just a general um, service fee um, would. Um, so we suggest considering the following. Um, establishing an ascending block rate structure to encourage water conservation um, within the town, um, as well as establishing uh, fixed quarterly charges to ensure um, stable and predictable revenue. And then to figure out what those quarterly charges and what each block tier and corresponding rate would be, um, we'd recommend conducting a water rate study that would look at all your O&M costs, your operation maintenance costs, as well as your capital needs costs. Um, that will help you focus on setting the tier rates um, for the block rate structure and assess whether service fees based on meter size or different user categories will be beneficial to the town. Uh, next slide. Any questions? So we are gonna pause for a moment and take questions. Uh, Kathy, you have your hand up. Hi, yes, thank you for a very clear presentation. Um, I have a series of questions, so maybe I'll just list them um, and then um, you can figure out how to respond. Um, if we were moving to block rates, could we, I'm, I'm assuming, but I should ask it as a question, can we set the tiers differently for residential, commercial, and industrial, you know, so including, you know, have three tiers for one of them, but only two tiers for another and different rates in each. Um, the second question is, uh, UMass and Amherst College, would they be considered commercial or are they considered residential? Um, uh, so just uh, what category do they fall in? The third is if we went to tiered and block rate, could we exempt agriculture? Because they're a single rate now um, if we wanted to. So again, you know, can we differentiate? Um, and then my last one is um, we discussed, Paul presented a, a municipal regional sharing agreement for um, when we're short with Hadley. And um, I saw that Hadley, rate, the Hadley tiers rates, if we went to block rates with tiers, um, would we be going to the residential tiers with Hadley? Would we be going to something else? So it's a Hadley specific. I think that's all. I mean, I had another one, which does Amherst have a fixed quarterly charge, but I think since you're recommending it on your last chart, the answer is no, we don't, you know, on that chart 14 that showed us other towns. So those I think for now are my questions. So I'm going to suggest that we collect the questions, since some of them may be similar, and then you answer them. So Andy? Hi. So I have uh, two questions, and thank you for the presentation. It was very helpful. One uh, has to do with the agricultural rate and its implementation. My recollection as a former member of the select boards, it was on the select board when we adopted that system was, that there was one barrier for some of the agricultural communities uh, members and that was that um, it required um, restructuring the water pipes within their property if they also had a house on the property so that they could differentiate between what they were using for residential and what they were using for agriculture and I was wondering um, if anybody knows whether that has been a limit on the uh, use of the agricultural uh, rate structure that we established. Uh, so that was one round of questions. And the other is, uh, I, I'm assuming uh, from what all you've recommended that the experience in other communities that have uh, descending or ascending, excuse me, ascending rate structures is that uh, it has reduced usage 
uh, I was wondering if that's in any way quantifiable, whether the amount of reduction um, is somehow measurable. Okay. And uh, Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. I thought Sarah was going to be next, but she must have <laughs> unraised her hand. Um, I, I have the question about institutions too. Um, one of my questions with the institutions is, um, you know, you say the block rates are for non-essential use as you get up, but I don't know how the institutions are metered. There's a lot of residential in those institutions. So part of the large use is probably considered mostly essential in that it's people living and showering and all of that. So how how would we account for that in a block rate structure um whether it's splitting them out or if they're commercial or something but if they're residential how do we account for that if we can't do sort of a de descending thing after a certain point um the agricultural separate meters is that something that residences could use for irrigation and lawn care um is is a question i had um the service charges that you're recommending um it looks like it's a one charge per quarter we have a number of residences that do not are not on the sewer system because they have septic tanks so is the quarterly charge for a service charge or something is it water only is there a water quarterly charge and a sewer quarterly charge um how does that work okay um uh, Bob Hagner. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I apologize for my COVID appearance here, but um, I wasn't expecting to be on video. Um, but I just have a. I'm, I'm coming to this relatively new, and I have a maybe a, a basic question, which is, what is the problem we're trying to solve here? And Paul, maybe you can answer that, or or Lynn. Okay, thank you. We're going to hold on. Darcy? Thank you. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> I think one problem we're trying to solve, and I know I'm not the answer, is just um, the problem of overuse of water. And what I, my question is, do we have the data on which sector um, is the you know, the different water usage in each sector so that we can see where is the most impactful part of town where conservation would be most effective. Um, and just generally, do we have the data on residential, commercial, um, institutional, if that's separate from commercial, agricultural, and so on? Um, interested in that. Okay, Kathy? You had additional questions? Yeah, I had, um, it's just a, a last one. When you come back with potential recommendations for us, um, it's a request. We've got a um, big study to put in a new water processing plant and a large capital expenditure. Um, can we see the rate impacts of different decisions out 10 years when those capital costs come in, as opposed to just one or two years. Um, so just get a, a longer term view of if we make a change, here are our fixed costs um, going outward. Okay, so I'm gonna to try to organize how we get at these. And I'm gonna start with Paul and Guilford and Amy and just ask, couple questions. What are we trying, what problem are we trying to solve? And do we have connect, reconnect fees and any other basic things you think we should know about our present water system that came up in these questions? So I'll start and then I'm going to hand it off to Guilford and Amy. Um, so those are, the, you've raised some really excellent questions. And again, I thank the presenters, Justine and Megan, for doing a great job on laying out the framework for that we're, that we're reviewing. So um, this is a new role for, relatively new role. The council is relatively young in, in its occupancy of, of, the, of the board, being Board of Water and Sewer Commissioner. So it's a really good uh, time for us to step back and look at how we are doing things. Um, 
I think Amy and uh, Guilford can talk about how the state and their uh, oversight of management of larger water resources are going to be encouraging the town to be taking uh, steps to manage its water resources. One of the tools for managing water resources is through the, through the rate setting structure. Um, so the, Bob asked, uh, what is the problem we're so trying to solve? I think it's the management of a valuable resource that we have and are we doing it right? And are we, as we look proactively and pro project prospectively into the future, um, are we gonna ha recover enough of our water use uh, or through our revenues to offset the expenses of our system? Now, just one caveat before I turn it over, these are, we're in a particularly bizarre time because our two largest users have depopulated their campuses and that's gonna create incredible stress on our system. So uh, we need to look at it with that in mind, but also to take out the, um, you know, to, to look beyond that once, whatever the future holds for those, the, those three institutions uh, comes to the forefront. So Guilford or Amy? Hey, um, can you hear me okay? Yes. So just to correct one thing, we used to have block rate structures. Um, when I came here in 2002, we had block rate structures and we had a block rate structure until about 2007 or 2008 when it was actually eliminated and we went back to single rates. And that was for a political reason. Um, we are gonna be asked by DEP in the future as our permit is renewed that we use what they consider best management practices to charge for our water. And one of those practices is a block rate system. So in the future, maybe two years out, maybe three years out, we will be asked to re-look at our, our rate system and think about changing it then. Um, just a little background there. Okay. Is there anything else basic about our basic water and you know sewer structure that you feel we should know? I believe there was one question. Question: Does Amherst have a quick fixed quarterly charge? We don't have a quarterly charge. Um, there is a, a meter meter rental. meter rental fee for every quarter, but it's very it's very insignificant. It's um, it was probably put on a long time ago. It's just never been updated. We don't really have a significant quarterly charge. We charge anybody. Okay. So that, now I want to turn to the consultants. And I, the way I heard the questions, they came in a couple different groups. One was around agriculture. Another one was really around the different levels of residential, commercial, and industrial. And then we got more specific about our higher ed institutions. Um, we may have more as well. Um, and then the other question that did come up was whether or not we have any, we have the data to go on that helps educate us about where we are right now. That's probably a combination of our consultants as well as Guilford. So you wanna get going? Um, sure, I mean, I can, I can try to start some of them that, that I kind of wrote down some notes. Um, so as far as the different tiers and the, and the different usage groups, there is almost an infinite number of ways that you could do it. You could do, yeah, separate tiers for commercial, separate tiers for residential. You can treat the, um, the, the, the colleges as their own usage group. Um, I'm not quite sure about how the second one, but I think UMass um, has large meters that basically the water that flows in gets tracked. They're not individual meters on the individual buildings. Um, so, so yeah, they, they would typically be more of a, a higher total just the way that, that that's metered. So you, you would probably have to, to look at that separately um, regardless of, of what you choose to do. The flip side of it is you don't want to overcomplicate this. I mean, we, we can engineer it to you know, forever and come up with minute changes in, in the different rate categories, but you're, you're going to want to be able to maintain some stability in, in what's going on um, to keeping it simple does still give that opportunity for, for lower water usage to be built at lower rates and promote that conservation, but then also not necessarily 
punish um, some of the, the commercial users that, that are more using water for, for process as opposed to, um, you know, they're not watering their lawns. So it, it's a lot of detail that goes into kind of figuring out what would work best for you, um, but, but you can basically complicate it as much as you want or, or simplify it. Um, it. It does, as you kind of see some of the other ones, you know, Northampton does only have two tiers um, and, and that's what works for them. It, it's going to have to kind of look at the data. Um, there is a good amount of data available. Um, you, you can look at billing records. Um, you know, the you have each user and you can kind of total their usage um, for each a year period or a quarter or, or however you guys bill it. Um, we have done a little bit looking at that for other projects that we've worked on with, with the town. Um, we've actually kind of mapped some of it where we've actually assigned the usage to a parcel. Um, it's not super detailed because it's kind of like a quick quick overview to kind of see where the usage clusters are where where they're more heavily concentrated um, so there are different things you can do with mapping and looking at where, where the usage is I think that was one of the questions um, the question about the looking at the the 10 years down the road that can all be part of the rate study a, a rate study too can be as simple looks looking at an immediate you know one to two year impact on rates or you can look at the bigger picture with with known capital stuff coming um, in the future that that can all be worked into the scope of what you're looking at in a rate study i don't know where <laughs> there's a lot of questions know, do we have data that shows that in places that have put this into in, into effect that it has in fact reduced water usage. I'm sure there is data. I don't, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that where it would be kind of um, readily tracked. You kind of would have to, you know, look at an individual community to see if they, what they've seen. Um, you're, as part of the rate study, you're, you're gonna have to kind of factor in that there are places um, that, you know, especially if, they're trying to promote it. If, if places that have a high usage, there definitely is, is places where this is seen. Um, one of the communities that we do look at has one of the higher rates in the state. Um, they actually have a very complex meter system that they installed. It's a, it's a much smaller community. It's a much smaller system where um, people can actually see their water use real time. It's a, it's a different, different way to meter that it's all on the cloud and it remotes back. Um, so a person can actually go in and see what they're using on a day-to-day -day basis. And when they implemented this, that metering program and the block um, ascending use, just because their rates are so high, they did see some dramatic decreases in um, how much water people were using because they could see it real time um, and also saw the impact on their bill with, with decreasing their water use. Um, but again, it's different for every community. You have to factor that into your rates as well, that there is gonna be some conservation. So if your water use goes down, you're still gonna require the same amount of funds to run your system. So you have to balance that in when you're developing the rates. Okay, and then we got into the issue of the agriculture and also people who, for instance, might wanna use it for gardening and lawn. And we have a number of garden centers. We have um, a golf course or was a golf course. Um, and how have you seen that applied in the agricultural side of the world? So let, let, me, let me take that question because we wrote our agricultural rate system a specific way for the town of Amherst. You cannot use an agricultural meter unless you qualify in one of those two categories they actually noted in the presentation. Your land has to be an APR or you have to be actively producing a crop with it or some type of agricultural product. So to use your agricultural rate for someone to water their lawn is not allowed in the way we have it set up. And it's meant to do that because watering your lawn is not an essential service. Essential water use is not to keep your grass green. Um, so that's how ours is set up. Um, we have only one person who actually has an agricultural meter, we believe. We had two people take applications out, and I know there's only one person who has an agricultural meter at this time. And no one who had a problem with their plumbing, to go back to Andy's question, has actually uh, gone all the way through the process to set up their account as an agricultural account yet. There's another question about a sharing agreement with Hadley and how would our structure 
apply to that? I'll take that one too, if you don't mind. So the agreement we have with Hadley is to become more open and more thought, uh, more thought put into how we actually interact with them. We've been sharing water with them. We've been providing water to them since about uh, four or five years ago. We started providing water to them for maintenance and emergencies when they had emergencies or maintenance they had to do. Um, we charge them the same rate we charge everyone else in the system right now. So as we go move forward and talk, start talking to them about working together, that gives us the opportunity to look at how we provide rates and how we structure our agreements in the future with them. So we and they both understand that the rates may change as time goes on. Um, technically, right now, it's very hard for Hadley to provide us water. Um, they, we have to put an actual pump out there to pump the water to us. Um, if we actually wanted to set something up that's more permanent, there would be a permanent structure which would have to be installed for us to take water on a regular basis from Hadley. Can I jump in here for one second? Please. Um, because one of the questions that came up, and since we're talking about Hadley, was um, Guilford about uh, fluoride in the water with Hadley. Can you address that and how that would go about sharing? So whenever we provide water to Hadley, if it's a scheduled, um, if it's a scheduled event, they actually notify as they're required to do their board of health and the, the residents as they're, there's a requirement for how they do it. I don't really know because we don't do it. Um, they're required to notify the residents that they're going to take water from Amherst and that there's fluoride in it. So right now, over the five years, there's not been any issues with the providing Hadley with water with fluoride. Okay. Um, another question. Yes, actually, this is more my question. When we look at Amherst, I, there was a conversation at one point that if UMass Amherst wanted to, they could just dig their own wells. Is that true, or would they be tapping into our water table? Um, technically, yes. UMass could go through the process of becoming their own water system. It would be very hard to do. Um, one, it's very hard to permit new water sources, especially when you have existing water sources in the same aquifer. Um, Hadley has their, if they were to, well, depending on where UMass put the well, they would either be in Hadley's aquifers or our aquifers. And there's a long drawn out process for that. The second thing they would have to do is they would actually have to separate, physically separate their system from our system, which is almost next to impossible without doing some major, major, major expenses. Um, we <coughs> run our system with UMass through master meters. So they would have to install a separate system to pipe to all their buildings to be their own water system. And then they would have to actually staff up and meet all the requirements we meet. They'd have to have a CCR. They'd have to do, um, a CCR is a consumer confidence report. They would have to do the annual stats reports to the state. They would have to do the sampling they, that we do. Um, we sample on their campus for our system now. Um, they would have to build that whole system together and actually run that system. Before I go back and ask whether we've answered everyone's question, I have one more and that was, what was the political reason that led to getting out of it the last time? Has anybody else joined this meeting besides the people that are there? No. Um, the town was looking for financial. Uh, but I, I should note that this meeting is being recorded and will be online. Thank you. Maybe I won't answer that. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Uh, have we missed any questions, people? Uh, Lynn? Paul. So I think that a lot of the questions revolved around the institutions, you know, Hampshire, UMass, and Hammers College. And maybe if Guilford can sort of outline how we service those three institutions, because those are our three major water users. And because that will come into play a lot in the council's consideration. Um, Okay, why don't Can we you, are there, is there that. like one meter or they have multiple meters, Guilford, that kind of thing? Yeah, why don't we go ahead and do that and then we do have some additional questions. Okay. okay. So how we service Amherst College, actually all three of the colleges, is primarily they have master meters and the meter, the water flows both ways through the system. So 
water flows into campus and if we need water on the other side of the town it can flow out of campus and we subtract the two numbers and that's what they're billed for for use. Um, they actually, Amherst College and UMass actually have individual meters at their facilities. So they actually monitor usage at their individual facilities and classify it by their facilities. We treat them only as an institution. And this is your bill. This is the institutional bill. If we decide we want to have UMass and classify each individual buildings, this is a research building, this is a residential building, this is a something else building. Uh, we could do that, but we'd have to have uh, help from UMass and Amherst College, and they, they are set up for it. Uh, Hampshire College is not set up for it. Hampshire College has only one meter, and it goes in, and that's it. So Hampshire would be a little harder to differentiate their different uses there between residential and whatever we wanted to use as choices. But we could possibly do it and it would just take longer to set it up. All right, Mandy Jo? Yeah, I, I was still looking to see about an answer about service charges and whether they're separate for sewer and um, just water use or not, or can you do that because we have so many people on a septic system? So we do charge, if you have a service charge for water, it's only charged for water. If you have a service charge for sewer, it's charged for sewer only. Um, they're separate charges and they're totally kept different. Okay. Sarah? So I just want to make sure that uh, just to make it clear that I'm really hoping that the agricultural rate that we have right now, I think it was really well thought out. And I feel like farmers really lobbied for it. And I feel like Amherst definitely responded. And I just want to make sure that we're going towards a block system or a tier system that that would stay in place. Okay. Uh, Andy. Yeah. Um I guess the comment uh, uh, just on that last piece as you get circling back to the um, thing that Guilford responded to sooner is that uh, it has to technologically be capable of uh, measuring the agricultural use, which gets close to my next question, which is um, colleges and um, in the university and others, how much of the water is being used for athletic fields? And is there any uh, other way to reduce our water usage from our um, drinking water system to achieve that goal, such as uh, a, a brown water recapture from the water treatment plant? So we, we don't actually have the actual numbers of how much water they use for irrigation. Um, they, have, they don't really have those numbers either, and they've been working on getting those numbers together. They actually use more potable water in cooling and heating than they actually use in irrigating fields. Um, so that's the one place we've actually been focusing on for what we call the reuse water system at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, we do provide effluent from the plant to UMass and they treat it um, to use for this cooling as well as heating at the central heating plant. Um, and that's something we really want to keep pursuing and we want to keep moving forward with because taking reuse water from the wastewater plant does allow you, like we just talked about, to then use it for cooling, heating, uh, flushing for toilets. Some of their buildings are built for uh, uh, purple nice. water for flushing and then irrigation. So there's, there's things that we've been talking to the university about, things in the process that would actually help reduce water usage. Um, but then again, as the, I think Justine said, or Megan said, um, you reduce your water usage, you still have fixed costs. So you have to have a balance there between making sure you pay for everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Paul, you have your hand up. Yeah, just two things. I wanna make sure that if anybody has any other questions on the intermunicipal agreements, which are gonna be on your agenda on Monday, this is a good time. Um, but the, to Justine and Megan, um, you look at lots of different cities and towns, and that's the, the vantage point that you're able to bring to us. We have three large users and three these three higher ed, ed institutions, but other communities have large users also, like uh, in Northampton, they have the Coca-Cola bottling plant and things like that. 
how have other towns addressed the idea of having one or two or three mega users plus then you have this large residential and then the other question being on top of that is how how do we how would you classify the university and the colleges in terms of are they residential institutional or would could we just make that up as we go um, so I'll, I'll, I don't know um, the details of Northampton's um, rate study, but they do have, um, they have their tiered usage for um, um, users, but they have a large user with the meters over one inch, which I'm guessing the Coca-Cola bottling plant would be, which is slightly lower than their highest tier. So that could, I don't, I can't speak to the details, but that could be how they um, factored that in, the large users. Yeah, I mean, again, for, for other communities that, that have a large user, it, it is this balance that that they do typically tend to, to probably take up the bulk of what your, your costs are through their rates. Um, and then it's that, that balancing act of, of where do they fit in a rate structure. I think that especially, um, you almost have to treat them the same. Like obviously you can't treat UMass different than, than Amherst College because their use is, is probably on a completely different order of magnitude. You probably would need to look at those separately and whether you put them with commercial or you have a separate category for institutional just because it, it wouldn't necessarily, the way that they're billed be fair to just blanketly put them in the highest residential user category. There, there has to be kind of, the, and it, maybe it is that rate is the same rate that they get, but you're, you're kind of tracking it differently. Um, it is a kind of a system specific thing. I mean, this, you guys are unique in, in the position that you have with, with, the, with the facilities that you have and the percentage of water use that they use compared to the percentage that the other people use. Um, you know, other cities like we do stuff, Worcester, they have a balance with their commercial users and, and all the colleges as well. I'm not 100% sure how they treat them differently in their rates, um, but I believe they have a relatively simple rate structure, um, just that, that they kind of factors all of that in. Um, you know, they're also selling water to different communities that that tends to, um, their, their rate study is probably much more complicated than anything needs to be for, for you guys. Um, but it, it is kind of a, a unique situation. Again, I think Northampton covers it. They, they have that block rate. I think that the, from my understanding, because we, we have worked with them in the past, that the usage at the Coca-Cola plant remains relatively steady over time. Um, you know, they're, they're not, every once in a while, they'll, they'll do kind of a, a revamp up of some of their production, um, whether they're 24 hours, six hour days. Um, and that does change, change their water use. But for the most part, it's kind of a fixed number that I think makes it easier for them to factor into their rates and why that, that rate was probably developed for that side of things. Um, as far as the colleges are concerned, they probably do have a pretty similar use pattern um, where Obviously, if they're on campus versus not on campus, their their usage needs um, until they kind of do massive expansion projects remain relatively steady. They're still going to need to run the cooling towers. They still need to run the heating plants. They're still going to need to irrigate the fields. Um, obviously, a drought may factor into that. They might use a little bit more in in or want to use a little bit more in a, in a hot weather situation. But it's still something that you can probably quantify a little bit better than you would um, the residential house usage. So I, I want to just stay on this one for a minute because basically what we have with Amherst College and, and um, UMass is kind of a mixed use water user. Um, it's not all one or the other. And, and, and unlike, um, for instance, Cambridge, Worcester, Boston, we don't have much commercial. So to suggest that now all of a sudden they're commercial is kind of not the same. So I think it, it would be interesting to see how other places that have multiple higher ed institutions deal with, the, with those higher ed institutions. Um, but meantime, we also have another question from Kathy. I, um as I understood it, so you could correct me, we could create a classification called higher ed, so we wouldn't have to put them in commercial. So that's one. 
And then I just want to know whether I heard that right and if we wanted to. And then the second is we have not very many, but we have some large apartment buildings. And do we currently, um, Guilford might know this, do we build the entire complex for all the water use or do the a different apartment people get like a monthly or a quarterly water bill? Um, so just thinking of a different kind of residential uh, that, and are there apartments m metered, you know, like someone takes 15 showers a day or doesn't, you know, on, in terms of usage. Um, and we only have a few, but uh, just how do you treat large apartment complexes? So what, what we do now for the institutions and for the large apartment complexes is we read them on a monthly basis versus a quarterly basis. So they actually allows like the apartment complexes to track leaks faster. If you're waiting three months to get a leak, to see if you have a leak or high usage, it's hard for them. So they get a bill once a month, they can say, oh, well, look, I have, I have some leaks and then go look for leaks and try to sh shut it down. Or they can send a note out saying, hey, stop taking the third shower every day. You only take two showers a day. Um, so that's how we handle the apartment complexes um, and actually institutions, they get a monthly bill as well. So if we, go to, we, if we go to a block rate system, like we said, we can make any classification we want to. Um, the classification that most people use right now for colleges is institutional. And that kind of covers a facility that has residential and classes and support services all together, an institutional rate um, or institutional classification. And that makes it a little different from um, just straight commercial. So yeah, also when you're looking at kind of the impact of a block rate structure promotes water conservation, it is typically more for residential users that that is true. I mean, a, a commercial user is still gonna need to use the same amount of water for their production. The college, the people using the water at least on the residential side in the dorms are not seeing the direct impact of their water use on the bill. So it kind of does take that part out of the equation. Obviously the, the college on a whole, um, higher education facilities do tend to want to promote water conservation um, on their own, just because you know the, the younger the students tend to, to want to gravitate towards that green infrastructure, the, the reclaimed water system that they have. Um, some colleges do things, um, one that we worked with had the students involved in a um, basically a trial program to, to pick low flow shower heads and which one they liked and they kind of gave them out in the dorm. So most colleges are, are doing that to promote conservation in their facilities as well to keep their water use down. Um, one way to kind of um, the, the apartments that they would possibly be pop up in a higher usage tier just because they have one meter um, going in. What other places do is when you would see some of those comparisons is base it on your meter size. So, you know, your residential tier structure could be based on your meter. So if you have a one inch meter or smaller, that is typically going to encompass your single family, maybe two family homes, um, maybe a multifamily situation, but a, a larger apartment is likely going to have a bigger than a one inch meter. So then those would be kind of have a different classification and, and whether you put them together in an in one, you know, large meter category, especially if you don't have a lot of commercial, that would kind of take your institutions and it could also take the, the larger apartments. But again, it, there are kind of a, a whole bunch of different ways that you can separate them out. Andy Joe. Yeah, I, I wanted to go back to the service charges. Um, just in talking about institutions and all, it, it struck me that the service charge seems to potentially be the same fee for all users, um, whether it be commercial or institution. Um, but we have, as, as you've heard, three places generally that use a large majority of our water, um, splitting that service charge to create a more, um, well, instituting a service charge, you've said, creates a more predictable revenue stream. But if you do that in a way that Amherst College is charged the same $32 per quarter that a residential is, that seems to be a bit unfair to all the residentials. So my question, I guess, would be, 
can you have different service charges for different types of institutional users where Amherst College's service charge might be, you know, the institutional service charges would not be $20 a quarter or whatever it might be because of so much larger use. Is that something that can be done or how would you do that? Yes, it could be done. And actually, I believe there is a difference between there's a resident, the service charges for a minimum minimum bill for the residences is, is much different than the minimum bill for a, what we call commercial and institutional right now. So we do have differences now. They're just, they're just, they're still relatively small charges. And the, I mean, the service charge also that we pay, it's, it's based on there, there's two things. There's the minimum bill for if somebody doesn't use above a certain amount, they get a minimum bill. But there's also a service charge that's the meter rental that's on every single bill, and that's based on the meter size. And so it's relatively low for residential, but it is higher because um, it's a bigger meter, bigger piece of infrastructure. So it is higher for, um, for the institutions or even the commercial accounts that have a larger meter. Lisa. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, make one point for the town council and the public who are watching this that um, uh, with the aside of that wonderful conversation about low flow shower head trials is that UMass has already instituted humongous water conservation to the point that it definitely impacted our town revenue years ago. And so that isn't something that's new. So speaking, for example, to Darcy's, you know, let's make sure we're conserving water. She's probably aware UMass has already done all the work there. And that's one of the reasons we actually need more money is because they don't pay as much as they used to. The other is I wonder if Guilford, not today, but as we move forward with this, could help characterize how this proposal fits in with the stormwater management that we hear about across our local communities who are freaking out about how they're going to pay for new requirements in stormwater management. Okay. Guilford? Well, this, unfortunately, the stormwater management is going to be a totally separate charge and totally, it, I mean, there's not going to be much relationship between the stormwater fees that we charge stormwater fees and the water fees, with the exception of is if you're a good person in stormwater and you collect your stormwater and it falls on your property and use it for irrigating or for use it for something on your property, instead of using your potable water, you'll actually have a, a lower potable water bill. Those are the types of things you could do, but um, there's, you're very limited as a residence in what you can really do with stormwater to have an impact on your water water bill. So they're gonna be two separate things and they're two separate fees probably. Okay, could you, would you explain just a little bit more on the stormwater stuff? I mean, are we talking a fee for something that flows into, uh, an area or how is storm water collected that allows you to charge a fee? So there, there's, there's many different ways to do this. Um, and this is totally a whole nother conversation and totally a whole nother multiple hours of discussion about this. Um, many places just charge a fee for based on the size of the property and how much of the property is impervious and how much of it is pervious. Um, other people have a use factor that goes into there. It's, there's many things you can do to make this fee um, to, and things you can do to compensate for the fee. If you have a big property and you have a lot of impervious area, but you pre-treat your stormwater before you lease it into a storm drain, you might get a discount on your stormwater fee. Um, it, it's totally a whole nother animal and it's a whole nother discussion, really. Okay. Could I just jump in there for a second, Lynn? Please, Paul. Just put in put in perspective, Guilford, why are we even talking about this uh, and why is this a concern uh, for the for the town? Yes, uh, so the stormwater, when we talk about stormwater, we have, we now have our stormwater permit. We we're permitted to uh, run a stormwater system, which we've been doing since the beginning of time as a town. Um, we have to meet requirements set by EPA and maybe some by DEP. Um, to manage our stormwater, and there's going to be a cost for doing that. They're going to require have requirements about amounts of water and loading on the water, nitrogen, phosphates, um, 
those types of things. So that's something that's coming in the future. And there's going to have to be some type of way of paying for the requirements we're going to be asked to do to clean the water before it's released to our downstream neighbors. Okay. Thank you. I think, I mean, that I just needed a little more context mm -hmm. of what all that was about. Mm -hmm. uh, are there other questions from the council or Bob, other attendees? We have no other attendees, by the way. Okay, so I guess um, the only the question I have now is, so what's next? To, to tell the truth, um, we're now kind of, this COVID situation has kind of really hit us um, in our revenue pocket a little bit, what's going on with the universities being closed and everything. But really the next thing to do is we look at the next as our next rates for the next coming years, does the council think they want to go to a block rate now, or would you like to see a comparison between the rates we would propose to charge versus how you could set up a block rate system? That's really where we're kind of at. And I mean, there's no requirement to go to a block rate system now. It's just a matter of time for us to research it and think about it and try on different things and see how it would compare. But you're saying we will have to go to one in the future. There's, there's probably going to be a requirement in our next Water Management Act permit uh, to have a block rate system within a certain amount of time. Okay. Paul? Thank you. Um, so when we initially set this up, this was pre-COVID, and Tate and Howard were ready to go, and then uh, to do the presentation, it was to set the groundwork for a larger discussion about where we were going with our with our rates, uh, where we we were we going with uh, introduce the concept of block rates, whether that's something that the council had an appetite for or not. Um, but then the world changed, and I think what the next steps, as you asked, is more is going to be on the finance side. We, we will be talking to you about where we are in terms of our two enterprise funds, the water, water system and the sewer system, and what has happened to the revenue streams, as it were, for those, those two uh, accounts. Um, I don't think we want to make decisions long term based on our current status. We need to address our current status in terms of our reduced revenue and how we're going to manage through that. But it is time to be thinking long term about um, you know, and I think as Kathy pointed out, looking longer term, um, and then to also start having the conversations with the co with the colleges and the university about what this might do, um, because if we have to raise X amount of dollars, and um, as you start to adjust your rate structure, it's going to shift those costs to different people, and it's just a matter of where the council wants to shift those costs. It's like the tax rate; you still need to raise it. You can put more of a burden on the proper on the commercial properties but then it, to lessen on the residential but it's sort of a um, you know, sort of, it's an interactive system that we'll be managing through so I think that this right now it's a really good introduction so we can educate ourselves about what what um, Justine and Megan brought to the table today um, in time for another conversation down the road and I think we're, you know, we're blessed to have Guilford and Amy here who are really experienced on this as well as, as our engineers. So Paul, as we get into the budget for F FY21, mm -hmm. um, and we have to set the water and sewer rates as well, I assume we're going to be looking at the impact of COVID on the existing trust funds or the existing uh, enterprise funds, yeah. Yeah. So I think, I mean, I'm watching Sonia. She's looking at her spreadsheets right now. She might be looking at them. But yes, that's one of the things that you'll be, um, we'll be presenting to you is what, what it looks like. Um, we are going to be looking at those funds. Our costs have not gone down for those um, uh, real, in any real way. Um, but our, our, our expenses you know, remain the same. So we're going to have to recover those costs or utilize our reserves as, as the same types of questions we're answer, asking about everything else. We have two more counselor questions. Kathy? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, with Lynn's what's next, um, as I heard you say, we're going to first deal with the current situation and get a better grip. So if we wanted the longer term look and block, I don't know how much work is involved in coming up 
with some potential choices and showing us if this way or that way. So would that be potentially later in the fall, you know, sort of a timing on how long? And then with that, um, would it be helpful since I heard both people from Tata and Howard, Megan and Justine say there's an infinite number of possibilities here. If we, if the council, whether it's at the finance committee or something said, we'd like to see at least these four or these six variations, you know, something that gave a framework of what ifs, not giving you the rate differences, but separate rates for, um, or would it be better for you just to think it all through and came us, give us three or four scenarios. So I'm just looking for what kind of, you know, if you're, rather than feeding something to us and having us ask all the same questions, would it, would it be better to get some early input just idea wise and then, you know, schedule something for late 2020 or early 2021 if we were gonna do a change? So personally, So personally, I would, I'd be, I would really appreciate it if you said this is what we'd like to see as possible rate structures. That would be, uh, that would be nice. That would kind of narrow it down for us, and that we don't have to kind of guess a bunch of things and come up. That would be nice if you just said we think these are what they should be, the classifications. Do you have recommendations for us on those? Uh, we could put some together based on our billing now and how we classify, how DEP classifies. We could put some together and send them to you and then you could think through them. I, I think that starting with some recommendations from you based on what we do know would be a good place to begin. Mandy Jo, you have a question. Mine was just on timing. Um, are we then looking, if we go into the studies and all now, are we looking at FY22 rate changes, uh, structure changes? Is it too late to implement for 21? And just the timing of how soon do we need to start to get it for FY22? Or is there even a possibility for FY21 at this point? So Sonia, you can weigh in here if you want to, but we will be recommending a rate structure for FY21. Um, uh, as part of our budget process, typically. Um, and then, you know, in terms of major changes, I think was that would be something that would be doing um, down the road. Let do, me do, also do. caution. I, I mean, the problem we're going to have is that the data for FY20 and the data for FY21 are just going to be totally whacked out <laughs> because, I don't know, it's, it's a technical term. Um, <laughs> It's, um, and it's because of the higher ed usage. And, and then if they complicate things and don't come back full, fully in the fall, or they come back with significant lower enrollment, I don't see us being able to do anything in terms of actually changing our rate structures until FY22 at the earliest. But I do think we could get the classification discussion going so that it could help direct and make best use of the study. That's my personal opinion. I'm looking for, I'm looking at Sonia because I want you to nod, Sonia. <laughs> I was trying not to have to talk. <laughs> um, well, we're going to have to have some rate changes for fiscal year 21. We just have to go back and relook at them. We also have to notify certain people within a certain amount of time. So I'd have to. Paul, I have to talk to you about that. Right. So um, there is going to be some rate change for fiscal year 21, for sure. We need, to, we need to get these hearings on the schedule and get the proposals out there so that they're done with all the qualified amounts of time and so forth. And I don't see us being able to do this in on top of everything else right now mm -hmm. um, for FY21. So it does seem to me that the earliest would be FY22. But as a council, I, I go back to, you know, my takeaways for this is we're looking for Guilford and Amy and our consultants to give, give us some recommended definitions of categories. And, that, and then based on that, we'll say, gee, those look like good categories or could you tweak it this way? And then you would go back and build a model or a couple scenarios based on those categories. That's the long term. The short term is we need to get the sewer and 
water hearings scheduled in the rate set. Mm -hmm. Is there other, am I missing anything? No, sounds. Okay. No, no, that's part of our, the, the, the plan going forward. Yes, you got it. Is that any other counselors want to weigh in on my kind of summary there of the order of doing business and what we need to get done? Okay, are there any other questions from counselors while we have these experts here who, you know, look at water every day? <laughs> Not, I, I want to just tell you, thank you for a terrific presentation. Uh, I think it, you did exactly, you accomplished exactly what the goal was, was to get this conversation moving. And um, you did it with uh, some really significant ways to help us look at that. And so, um, Paul, good way of time on this. And counselors, we'll see you on Monday night. I want to thank you very much. The slides were clear, and you added information as you talk. So thank you very much. Great. Thanks to all of you, and thanks Guilford and Amy, everything, everybody at DPW for all the work you're doing right now. It's over the top. Thank you. Meetings adjourned. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks. Hey, Guilford. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't know if if you want me to give you a call when you guys are all in one place, but I was still looking for a response to that email I sent you about the water main.